here this evening. I ask that you would help us. I ask that you would use us to be a blessing tonight. Help us, Lord, to uh, learn something from the Bible. Help us to apply those truths to our heart. And uh, Lord, we sure thank you for it. We sure thank you for your goodness to us. We sure thank you for loving us and saving us. I pray you'd help us tonight. We ask for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, word number 47 is uh, it's spelled C-A-S-S-I-A. It's pronounced Kasha. C-A-S-S-I-A, pronounced Kasha. The word Kasha is found three times in three verses in our King James Bible. Come to Psalm 45, if you will. Should have told you that to begin with, Psalm 45. And we'll look at the verse here in just a moment. But this is a botanical word. This is a plant, a part of the legume species of plant. It's the kind that pulls nitrogen from the air and dispenses it through its root system, places it into the ground. By this process, it builds and strengthens the soil. This particular plant is useful for uh, medicines and also perfume. Uh, the sweet odor of the cassia is given off by the wedding garment of the bridegroom of the church. Look at Psalm 45, verse number 8. This is one of the three times that's mentioned in the Bible. It says, All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. And so it is obvious that this is a smell, uh, an odor. It gives off an odor on the wedding garment here that's made mention of in Psalm 45 and verse number 8. Now, most of the words, I don't know if you've noticed or not, as we went through these words in the Bible up to this is number 47, most of these words are, are not really old-fashioned words at all, but they are words that are dealing with different fields of knowledge, such as botany here, this word, uh, agriculture, geology, other things. And so it's not that the words are, are really old-fashioned at all, it's just topics or subjects that we don't have a lot of knowledge about typically. The other two places in the Bible this word is found, we won't look at them, is Exodus 30 verse 24 and Ezekiel chapter 27 and verse 19. All right, let's look at word number 48. It's cow, C-A-U-L, cow. I think that's how you pronounce it, best I could learn today. It's found 13 times in 13 or in 12 verses. Come to Leviticus chapter 3, if you will. This word comes from the field of the body's anatomy. The word literally means basket. Uh, it refers to the structure of the membrane that is covering the greater part of the lower intestines, and it's called a cow. It literally means basket. Look at Leviticus chapter 3. We'll read one verse here. Leviticus chapter 3 and verse number 4. As I mentioned, this word is in the Bible 13 times. Leviticus chapter number 3, verse number 4. The Bible says, And the two kidneys and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks and the cowl above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. And so sometimes this word, as the literal definition, I believe, especially here in this passage of Scripture, speaks of the membrane that, the membrane that is around uh, the kidneys and the inner parts, the lower part of the lower intestines. It is also sometimes uh, speaks of the membrane that is around the head of a child at its birth. And it's also sometimes refers to certain types of hair nets and tight fitting hats are also referred to as cows. And so uh, the literal meaning here for Leviticus chapter 3 has to do with that lower structure of the membrane that is referred to as a basket. All right, come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at word number 49, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I really like this word. We'll look at the word celestial, looking at C words. Look at the word celestial. Now, the word celestial is only found twice in the Bible, and both times is in this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's in verse number 40, but I want to read verse 39 first. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 39. The Bible says, All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. And so the word celestial means belonging or relating to spiritual, uh, relating to spiritual heaven 
or heavenly. And the word terrestrial uh, means belonging to the earth. Now, if you look closely at verse number 40, you'll notice that it says there are, present tense, there are celestial bodies. And since we, we understand and we know that the, the church age believers, we're not going to get our glorified bodies until after the rapture of the church. So this, this present tense where the Bible says there are also celestial bodies is speaking of other beings in heaven. We've talked about the heavenly host. I think the last time we talked about uh, this subject, we, did, we talked about angels quite a bit. They would probably fit that, uh, that as well, those, uh, the heavenly host. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 14, speaking of the, the angels, they are ministering spirits. And so the Bible here talks about celestial bodies. They are heavenly, belonging or relating to heavenly or spiritual heaven. And terrestrial is an earthly body. All right, now word number 50 is centurion. Centurion, this word is found 24 times in 24 verses in our King James Bible. All of those occasions, all 24 of those, is either in the four Gospels or the book of Acts. I didn't go through and look at that individually, but just from what I can think, I would think it probably is in the book of Acts more than any of the four Gospels, uh, maybe even combined. I, I don't, don't hold me to that. I should have looked at that today, but I do know it only occurs in the four Gospels and also in the book of Acts. So look, look if you will, in Matthew chapter number 8. A centurion is a non-commissioned officer of the Roman army. He was named that because he was in charge of a sentry or 100 soldiers, ordinarily 100 soldiers or sometimes can, uh, referred to as legionaries. Now, this is not to be confused with a legion, which consists of anywhere from three to 6,000 soldiers. Now, the first account of this word in the Bible is right here in Matthew chapter number 8 and verse number 5. Matthew 8, verse number 5. The Bible says, And when Jesus entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, a centurion beseeching him. So this man came unto him, begging him, and saying, verse number 6, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. If you remember when we were going through the book of Acts, probably the most notable passage of Scripture for the majority of us, as far as a centurion is concerned, we would probably think of Cornelius in Acts chapter number 10. And the Bible says there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. But we talked about a centurion a little bit when we was going through that. And it seems like every time that they appear in the Bible, they seem to have a, a pleasant <clears throat> a nature or pleasant demeanor, always some, seemingly speaking of them in a good light or in a good way. And so that is the centurion. All right, word number 51, come to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, we'll look at some of the foundation of New Jerusalem. The word is Chalced Chalcedony or Chalcedony, Chalcedony, I think is the proper pronunciation. It is spelled C-H-A-L-C-E-D-O-N-Y. It's only in the Bible one time, chapter 21, Revelation 21, Verse number 19. The Bible says, And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chalcedony, the fourth and emerald. So in the context which this word is found, it, it shows that this is some kind of stone or some kind of beautiful stone. It's listed here as the third material that is used in the 12 foundations of, of, to the wall around the city of New Jerusalem. This particular stone or this particular gem is an uncrystallized, translucent variety of quartz. It is usually a whitish color with soft blue tints and has a luster nearly like wax. Uh, a Chalcedony takes its name from the town Chalcedon in Turkey near the Black Sea. 
Now, there are different variations of this Chalcedony, or yeah, I guess that's how you say it. I, I learned all these today, but my, that, was, that was a long time ago. And I have the, I even have it divided out here the way it goes. I think, it, I think it's Chalcedony is, is the proper pronunciation. So if it has different colors, it has a different name. I'll give you an example of that. If, it, um, if, it formed, if it's in the form of stripes or layers, it is called an agate or an agate. I think it's the proper pronunciation, A-G-A-A-T-E. Uh, if, it's, if the stripes are all horizontal, we call it onyx. And so it's the same stone, different colors. It's called a different thing. All right, word number 52 is a chrysoprase. Now that's spelled C-H-R-Y. S O P R A S U S. I'll tell you something. I, I heard one time. I wish I, it's been many years ago. I was in West Virginia, and uh, I was with Brother John Davis. Brother JD may have been there. I'm not sure. I was with Brother John Davis. They was just getting started with the prison ministry. They hadn't even built the tabernacle and all that up on the up on the top of the hill where the rock is at. And we we went up there. We'd been working all day trying to get the prison ministry, the press, or something running. And we went up there on the top of that mountain in the afternoon around that rock before they ever built uh, the, um, the tabernacle up there. And we had, we had a service up there that night, uh, just the men that had, had come there to work on the, the property. And uh, there was a blind man. Brother John had had a blind man to come, and he was going to preach that night. And so we got him up there on the top of the mountain, and he quoted Revelation chapter 21 from memory and named every single one of these stones and properly pronounced them and everything. It was, it was quite incredible. I'll never forget that. I was a, that was a great afternoon of worshiping the Lord. That was a blessing. And so uh, anyway, we have this uh, chrysoprase. Chrysoprase is, the, is how this, I know it doesn't look like that, but from all that I have uh, learned and, and how the dictionary divides the word, that's how it's pronounced. And uh, this only time it's found in the Bible is here in Revelation chapter 21. It's in the very next verse, verse 20. It says, The fifth, the sardonyx, the sixth, the sardis, the seventh, the chrysolite, the eighth, the beryl, the ninth, the topaz, the ten, a chrysoprase, the eleventh, a janeth, the twelfth, an amethyst. And so by the context, we can find, we see very easily again that this is some kind of a beautiful stone. And it's actually, it's a green stone. Uh, it's actually the, it's a green, simply a green uh, chalce, chalce, chalcedony. I still am having trouble with chalcedony, the word before. If it's green, it's a chrysopus. And so that, that's all that it is. It's listed as the 10th material uh, here in the foundation of, the, of New Jerusalem, around the city of New Jerusalem. Um, more specifically, a chrysopus is a kind of massive quartz having very little luster, it is somewhat flinty in appearance, and the color is either grayish or leek green. And an alternative spelling for the word is chrysophase, chrysophrase, if you're interested in that. All right, word number 53 is a word that really is spelled entirely, completely different than the way it is pronounced. Come to Deuteronomy chapter 14. The word looks like to me it's shamos, C-H-A-M-O-S. The proper pronunciation for the word is shammy. That's right, just like you wipe your car with when you dry it. So um, the, lone, the lone appearance of this word in the Bible is in Deuteronomy 14 and verse number 5. The Bible says the heart and the roebuck and the fallow deer and the wild, gate, the wild goat and the Prayarg and the wild ox and the chamois. Now it's listed here as one of the clean animals that is permissible to. Uh, it's one of the permissible animals to eat. It's along with the sheep and goats. It is in the species of the antelope, and it's found on the the highest mountains or the loftiest mountain ridges of Europe. This particular antelope type uh, animal possesses remarkable agility in ascending and descending difficult places, and it is much sought after by many hunters. The name has become synonymous with types of very soft leather because such leather was first prepared from the skin of this particular animal. Word number 54, come to 1 Kings chapter 7. 1 Kings chapter 7, 
Word 54 is a chipiter. A chipiter. 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 16. 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 16. The, the word chipiter is found 29 times in 17 verses in the Bible. Of those 17 verses, uh, this verse, I believe, gives the best explanation or is almost self explanatory of what a chipiter is. The Bible says in 1 Kings 7, verse 16, and he made two chipiters of molten brass to set up on the tops of the pillars. The height of the one chipiter was five cubits, and the length of the other chipiter was five cubits. So a chipiter is the upper part or capital of a column or pillar, if you will. If you've, ever, if you've ever looked closely at it, maybe a, a really nice house or an exquisite building, they have these really fine columns out front. If they have something on the top of that column where it, where it touches to the, the ceiling, it is called a chipiter. That dressing around that is called a chipiter. The flared portion at the top of the column is a chipiter. All right, come to 2 Chronicles chapter number 9. We'll look at the word number 55. 2 Chronicles chapter 9. And that word is Chapman, C-H-A-P-M-A-N, Chapman. This word is only found one time in the Bible. And here it is, 2 Chronicles chapter 9. I'll read verse 13. It's actually in verse 14. The Bible says, Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred and three score and six talents of gold, besides that which Chapman and merchants bought, or brought, I should say, and all the kings of Arabia and governors of the country brought gold and silver to Solomon. And so a chapman is one who buys and sells. Here in verse number 14, uh, this chapman is either a purchaser or for merchants, or either he is a seller to the merchants. That's what a chapman is. All right, we'll look at two, uh, very quickly, we'll look at two misunderstood Bible doctrines, sometimes misunderstood Bible doctrines. Uh, come to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Bible doctrine number 5 is apostasy. Apostasy. Now, the word apostasy is not found in our King James Bible at all. It's not there. Apostasy is a falling away from a standing position. It is an abandonment of one's faith or profession or a departure from one's faith or religion. Now, I'll, I'll read this verse. I'm going to read this verse in 2 Thessalonians, but then I'll have to give you some, a little bit of clarity about the verse so you won't be misunderstood. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a fall in the way first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now I understand that the immediate context of this verse that we just read concerning falling away could very well be associated with the midpoint of the tribulation period because the Antichrist has concealed his real identity up until this point, and at the midpoint of the tribulation, he is about to be revealed as the son of perdition. There's going to come a fall in the way first. So I'm just trying to give you the idea of what apostasy is. Now look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Since the word is not in the Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So in these two verses they, that Paul wrote, there, he's talking about a great falling away or apostasy that will occur in the last days just preceding the Lord's return. Now, obviously, we, we're not in the tribulation period or anything like that. Don't, don't get confused about any of that kind of stuff at all whatsoever. But there does even seem to be a fall in the way uh, in our day. It seems that some of this prophecy could be being fulfilled even now. Um, I, I'm not saying that it is, but I will say this. It seems like in the last 50 years, people are much further away from God than they were 50 years ago. It seems like there's uh, much less in our country. We can't, that's certainly not a worldwide thing. There's a lot of countries that are having 
revival. A lot of places that want the Lord. Seems like America has become so hard, hardened and so resistant towards the gospel and has no desire for the things of God. Certainly is, has been and is a fallen away as a whole in our country. But I'm glad it doesn't have to be that way in your life as an individual. Amen. Now, I want to look at just a couple of present-day examples of apostasy. And the first one, I, talk, I want to talk about two men. I'll mention a third one, or maybe I'll mention four. But one that is very well known is Billy Graham. Now, Billy Graham, in his beginnings, you trace back to the 1940s. And Brother, uh, Billy Graham had a, had a great start. He started preaching in a trailer park on a Saturday and the Lord really, really used him really well. He had, he had quite a touch of God on his life and on his ministry. There's no doubt about that. It was very definite that he was standing for truth and righteousness and preaching the truth. Um, in fact, his first citywide campaign was in Los Angeles, California in 1949. And churches raved that he would bring revival like Billy Sunday and D.L. Moody. Now, I remember, I remember this. I put this in my notes today. I remembered it as I was going through my notes again and, and, and adding some things, taking some things out. I remember reading the autobiography of Billy Sunday. And Billy Sunday would go into these cities and start these revivals. And not every time, but numerous times, when Billy Sunday would leave that city, all the bars would be closed and all the brothels would be closed because either the owners of those places themselves got saved or so many people in the city got saved that they had no more patrons uh, visiting the, the place. So when he went to a city, God used him in a great way to, to have these revival meetings and, and the, the lives were transformed and the, the, the cities were transformed and uh, the, the, the counties dried up and the brothels closed. And so that people was comparing Billy uh, Graham to that in his beginning. In 1950, Graham's executive secretary, Jerry Beaven, replied to the question, will Billy Graham cooperate with the Catholics? Part of Beaven's reply was this. You asked if Billy Graham had invited Roman Catholics and Jews to cooperate in the evangelistic meeting. Such a thought seems ridiculous to me. Surely you must know that it is not true, and further that you should give any credence to the idea that Mr. Graham would even turn over any decision cards to the Roman Catholic Church seems inconceivable. And so that was Billy Graham's position in 1950. Well, the Roman Catholic hierarchy uh, began to buddy up to him. They began to brag on him. They began to invite uh, Billy uh, Graham to their fellowships, and they began to give him certain perks, if you will. There was a millionaire who was a, who was a devout Catholic. Uh, that multimillionaire's name was Randolph Hearst. He owned a string of syndicated newspapers. And in fact, he owned a New York journal. And he began to puff up Billy Graham, and in the end, in the end, Graham, listen, called the Pope glorious things and claimed to see no problem with him or the Roman Catholic Church. Graham began turning over inquiries. And what that is, he would have these humongous crusades. And when people would come forward, they would fill out an inquiry card, either concerning salvation or having a, a, de, having a desire to know more about the Lord. And he turned over, he began turning over those cards, some of those cards, to the Roman Catholic Church. Now, uh, he accepted honorary degrees from the Catholic schools. He flattered uh, popes with amazing accolades and visited the pope to seek his counsel. So he changed. He compromised. He left his original position on Roman Catholicism. I'll give you one example. Billy Graham went to Vancouver, Canada in 1984 less than a month after the Pope had been there. This was a marvelous opportunity for Graham to correct the Pope's false message. But shockingly, Graham's response to, Pope, to the Pope's Vancouver speech was, and I quote, I tell you, that was just about as straight an evangelical, an evangelical address as I have ever heard. It was tremendous. Of course, I am a great admirer of his, he gives moral guidance in a world that seems to have lost its way. So we see that although he was a good man, started out on the right path, doing a lot of great things, won thousands of people to Christ through his ministry, yet when Billy Graham uh, obviously changed somewhere 
near the end. There were thousands of folks saved through the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, but if those fakes, folks placed their loyalties in Roman Catholicism when Billy Graham did, they went astray just like he went astray. The second guy you may not know as well as Billy Graham, but unfortunately I probably know him better than I did Billy Graham, and that is Jack Van Impey. Now, uh, in fact, Jack Van Impey received his start in the ministry from Dr. Billy Graham. He began preaching and performing at Billy Graham's Youth for Christ events. Van Impey once stood alone and blessed, but soon apostatized just like Dr. Graham. There was a time in the late 1970s that Jack Van Impey was a great preacher. In fact, he had the highest rated Christian program on TV for many years. His TV program was broadcast on his, in as many as 25,000 cities across the United States and in as many as 150 countries worldwide. He had, he had a nickname that was probably one, uh, uh, the, one of the great nicknames because it was true about him. I heard him do it often. In fact, he was referred to as the walking Bible. And the reason he was referred to as the walking Bible was because of his extraordinary ability to quote scripture. In fact, it was said that he had committed over 22,000 verses to memory. And numerous times I heard him speak and it was not uncommon for him to quote entire chapters or entire sections of the Bible at one time while he was speaking. However, the large television, uh, television ministry uh, required bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger budgets. And because of that, it caused him to broaden his uh, invited churches to participate in his meetings. He needed more money. And so in order to secure those new friendships, he'd invite those liberal and modernist preachers on the platform just to pray. But as his base got wider, the independent Bible-believing crowd began to pull away from him and eventually, Impey was abandoned by the Bible-believing crowd. And all that he was left with was the modernist. Van Impey got very bitter with the fundamental Baptist crowd that abandoned him. And because of bitterness, he wrote a book entitled, Heart Disease in the Body of Christ. When Van Impey died on January the 18th, 2020, he had nothing but good things to say about the Pope and other Bible-denying religions. Following in those same apostatizing footprints and not far behind was Jerry Falwell. Most of these men had charisma and public appeal, so, they left, so the leftists began to wine and dine them. So with a plate of food, a fancy restaurant, and it all began to whittle down their resistance. We're warned about this kind of evil influence in Proverbs chapter 23. The Bible says this in Proverbs chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. It says, when thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee. And put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man, given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Listen, such is the way of politics between bad churches and false religions. What they want to do is buy you, especially if you are up there in that in that being you know, well-known, well-sought-after, it's easy you're a target. Now, somewhere in the process, I'm sure that God clearly spoke and warned each of these men that they ignored what he knew to be right, and the apostasy ensued. Now, I said all that. I don't want to leave you on that note. I was listening to the radio one day, and I used to listen to Oliver B. Green often. And I, I really, I still really, really enjoy listening to Oliver B. Green and uh, Lester Roloff and some of those, those good old-time preachers. But I remember... Brother Oliver B. Green saying this one day on his radio program. He said that one time one of those Bible publishing companies approached him and offered him large sums of money to endorse one of these Bible perversions. And obviously Dr. Green refused to do that, thank the Lord. And so you don't, you don't have to go down that path. It's a choice. And so that is what apostasy means. It means to forsake what you one time believed. So that's apostasy. Now, we'll, we'll look at one more thing. Uh, Bible doctor number six, apostolic signs. Apostolic signs. 
Now, the word sign appears 76 times in 67 verses, and signs, plural, 53 times in 52 verses in the Bible. Apostolic signs were God-given miracles that proved to others that God was indeed endorsing the man or the message. Come to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, look at verse number 17. Mark chapter 16, verse 17, the Bible says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, don't fall out with me over this name. I'm just telling you something I heard him say one heard him say one time that I really like. I heard Dr. Phil Kidd say this one time about this crowd that's able to cast out, says that they're able to cast out devils and speak in tongues. Now, this is not an exact quote, but it, it'll be close enough you can understand. He said, when they'll take a straw and suck the battery acid out of my car battery and French kiss a cobra snake, I'll believe they have the ability, and, and do it without being harmed, I believe they'll be able to cast out devils and speak with other tongues. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. That's, you know, if you, you, you claim to do one, it says they could do all of those, amen. And so, but, uh, so he said that they would, in my name, cast out devils and, and speak with new tongues. Now, it's important to understand that God gave these signs in the absence of a complete Bible. And these things were all ended by the end of the first century because after that point, the Word of God is sufficient enough to help us and direct us. Although the sign gifts all but dwindled at the end of the first century A.D., religious people who don't place a premium on what God's Word says, they place a premium on their feelings, their emotion, or their religion, instead of what the Bible says, they have continued and still do to this day magnify these signs. In fact, the Charismatics operate, and let me just say something right here, why it just crossed my mind. If I can remember his name, I will call his name gladly, because he has quite the following. He's recently made a movie talking about casting, I, I have not watched the movie, obviously, uh, talking about their ability to cast out demons and, and all of this. This guy has a very broad audience. I've heard many people mention his name. What is his name? Anybody know who I'm talking about? Who said something? Who? No, no, no. This is a local guy in Tennessee that's a young man and alive and well today and doing all of that. And I'm, I'm glad none of y'all know who he is. What a blessing. That's a, that's a tremendous blessing. But he's, he's um, in with some, got quite a, a Baptist following as well as a charismatic following, following, a Pentecostal following. And he recently left his wife for someone in the church that he's now married to. And uh, he claims that he can cast out devils and, and all kinds of stuff. So anyway, I'm glad you don't know who he is. I'll tell you right now, that, that's a bunch of junk. Don't get caught up in it. He got his following by talking about things that people agree with him about concerning abortion and all that kind of stuff. And he gained this great big following, got a bunch of people coming to church. He has a, a large online presence. And uh, then he drops this big deal. You'd be surprised. You would know some of the preachers that follow that. So be careful. Amen. Now, so these sign gives all but dwindled. <clears throat> Charismatics oftentimes continue to operate under the false assumption that these signs are still in effect today, and that is their duty to fulfill them. This is what the Bible tells us. We're going to read something in Exodus chapter 4 in just a minute if you want to go there. But that's why the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 2.15, to study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God wants us to study he wants us to work, and he wants us to rightly divide. And so when we're studying the spiritual gifts, the Bible divides signs and gifts into three categories. Now, the first one is one that you, we don't, you don't remember a lot, but it is one, and it's in Exodus chapter 4 where we could read something about it. And that is the, the first one of those are spiritual gifts that were given to the Jews were called Jewish signs. 
Now we see that with Moses in Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, verse number 1. The Bible says that Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto me. Now God had asked Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses is arguing with God that he can't do that. He said, they won't believe me. They'll not hearken unto my voice. For they will say, the Lord hath not answered or hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, what is in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. He cast it on the ground. It became a serpent. A serpent and Moses fled from before it. Good job, Moses. I'm with you. And the Lord said unto Moses, put, you know, let, me, let me show you how gracious God is. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. Ain't that a blessing? Get, get, get as far away from its head as you can. Put your head, take it by the tail. And when he did, he put forth his hand and caught it and became a rod in his hand. Verse number five. And they may, that they may believe that the Lord God is their fathers and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, put now thine hand in thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom, and behold, it was turned again as to his other flesh. And it came to pass, if, and it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry ground. And so Moses' rod turned to a serpent. It turned back to a rod again. He stuck his hand in his bosom, brought it out leprous, stuck it in again, brought it out whole, and, of course, talking about the water and the blood. So God gave these signs to Moses so that he could convince the people, the Jewish people, that he was a messenger from God. Now, so second of all, the second... Um, <clears throat> I talked about these gifts being divided into three categories. The second category would be uh, the spiritual gifts that were given to the apostles. They're called apostolic signs. And we won't read all of those places, but I'll tell you where you can find them. We won't go read them. Mark chapter 16, we just read. Romans chapter 15, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, these gifts were given. These signs were given. These abilities were given to the apostles uh, so that in their ministry, so that they could confirm that confirmed to the people that they were God's messenger and they were delivering God's message. And when all the apostles died off, these apostolic signs died off as well. And then we have what is referred to as the church age gifts, Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. These are given in the church age to help accomplish God's work. And these signs continue through the, the church age. Some of those are mentioned in Ephesians as well. And... Uh, uh, what we need to keep in mind that they are called signs, and 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 22, talks about the fact that the Jews require a sign. Now, I have numerous passages of Scripture that goes with all of these. I'm going to mention three things here, but, I, but I'm not going to give you all the places or read all the places. But the Bible does say in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, that the Jews require a sign. So the nation of Israel began with signs. In fact, the Bible says in, in, in Romans chapter 4, when it's talking about Abraham and his faith, the Bible says that Abraham received the sign of circumcision. So the nation of Israel began with signs. Second of all, the nation of Israel lived by signs. And third of all, the nation of Israel demanded signs even from Christ. And so although the 12 apostles uh, evidenced these signs in their early ministry, even the apostle Paul had these sign gifts. We know that, and these abilities. We understand that, but these began to dwindle by the end of the first century A.D. Now, the charismatic movement today seems to be trying to keep alive these gifts, these miraculous apostolic signs, with a special emphasis on two of them in particular, and that's the gift of healing and speaking in tongues. I want to say three things about this healing and healers today. First of all, look at 2 Timothy. Come to 2 Timothy chapter 2, or 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse number 20. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 20. Esterus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus I left at Miletum sick. 
Now, I, I want to mention two more, and then I'll say something about those. So Paul left Trophim, Trophimus at Miletum, at Miletum sick. Now, look at 1 Timothy. You're in 2 Timothy. Come to 1 Timothy. Come backwards just a page or two to chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Paul gave Timothy medical advice instead of healing him. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 5, 23, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine off infirmities. So instead of healing, Paul said, here, take some medicine. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse number 30. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 30. Paul had infirmities of his own from which he could not be healed. The Bible says here, if I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern mine infirmities. Now, we won't take the time to do so, but 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 5 through 10, you can read about some of those infirmities that Paul had. So if the apostolic signs were still in effect when Paul penned these scriptures, there would be no reason for any of this sickness. He could have just healed them. He could have healed Trophimus. He could have healed, uh, he could have healed Timothy. He could have healed himself, amen. But he, he wasn't able to do that. So they were not still in effect. Now, now listen, we, we firmly believe that God is still able to heal the sick. I believe God is still able to work miracles. I, I still believe that God is still able to heal anyone he chooses. And we believe that the prayers of God's people can move God to work miracles. Now listen, if, if, the, the, I don't say much that I ask you to remember, but remember this. I think this is really good. I believe this is important. Let's not confuse answered prayers with apostolic signs. The two are vastly different. I'm glad that God hears. I'm glad that God answers prayers. Amen. But these apostolic sign gifts are over. Now, I still believe that God heals, but I do not believe that there are any so-called faith healers today. Amen. Now, speaking in tongues. I'll go through this quickly. What about speaking in tongues today? Well, there are four different terms in the Bible in relation to tongues, but these four terms come under two categories or two distinct sets. Now, literal foreign languages, literal foreign languages are referred to as new tongues in Mark 16. They are referred to as other tongues in Acts 2.4, and they are referred to, referred to as diverse kind of tongues in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse number 10. All three of those fall under the category of a literal foreign language. Now, I think it's six times, six times in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 14, or 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we find the phrase unknown tongues. Now, I believe this is unintelligible jibber-jabbers or whatever. It sounds like a Yamaha, Honda, Harley Davidson, something. I'm not sure what it is, but um, maybe it's, um, I don't know, chainsaw. I don't know. So, Anyway, these, these, unknown, these unknown tongues, the Corinthians claimed, the church claimed that their tongues their, was a real thing. Paul gave uh, believers everywhere a, church, a checklist to determine, to determine whether the unknown tongue in a church setting was real or phony, whether it was actually of God or whether it was of the flesh and the devil. So there are five rules for unknown tongues in a public setting in a church. And they're all stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. The first rule on unknown, uh, for these unknown tongues is two or three at most. The second rule is one at a time. The third rule is one must interpret. The fourth rule is an unbelieving Jew must be present. And the fifth rule is it must be a man and no woman. And almost every church or everything that I have ever seen about that is usually the women who are speaking in the jibber-jabber. So these, look, let me give you the verses for this. 1 Corinthians 14, 20, verse 27, verse 28, verse 22, verse 34, mentions all five of these rules that I just made mention of. Now, just because folks have been speaking in an unknown tongue for thousands of years does not mean in any way, form, or fashion that the Holy Ghost has anything to do with it at all. I'll tell you why. 
The church, of state, the church of Satan speaks in what they refer to as an unknown tongue. I doubt seriously, in fact, I'm 100% positive, the Holy Ghost has nothing to do with that. According, according to uh, Abeka's Revelations, a church history book, page 8, 128, it talks about Mormons speaking in tongues. And so if Mormons are speaking in tongues, I promise you the work of the Holy Ghost is not involved in that at all whatsoever. So why do people just automatically assume or figure that if something is highly abnormal or miraculous, that it must be of God? It's not. Amen. We have a, we have a Bible to determine those things. And what a blessing it is that we do. All right, we'll stop right there for this evening. Father, we thank you for the Bible. I'm glad that you have not left us here to guess and wonder. I'm glad that you've given us a Bible. And Lord, we can, we can work, we can study, we can rightly divide with the help of the Lord, and we can learn how that these things are to be used and how that they were used, and they were definitely needful and meaningful at one time. We sure love you. We sure thank you for loving us. We sure thank you for the word of the Lord. And Lord, please help our church to grow and be prosperous and pleasing to you. And for all that you do, Lord, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you so much.